ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه ثم اما بعد الحمد لله الحمد لله على نعمه الاسلام والسنه all praise and thanks belong to Allah for guiding us to Islam and for guiding us to the sunnah this is a ni'mah that is tremendous indeed undoubtedly bila shak wa bila raib uh, we continue going over some important some important matters in light of the the book in the sunnah in this class primarily is a sister's class but this is not to say that brothers also cannot benefit from it because bila shak wa bila raib the things that are going over that we're going over here then this is incumbent that everyone knows them now it is incumbent that everyone knows them and they are firmly grounded in them so that we may benefit but in particular the address here and the focus and target group here are the sisters because their importance is of extreme importance when it comes to rectifying a society and this is because any society could be measured as regards to its health or lack thereof by looking at its smallest unit and the health of that smallest unit and the smallest units within any given society then bila shak wa bila raib that is the the family that is the family and if the family is strong then this is an indication that the society is strong and if the family is weak then this shows the weakness of the society and when it comes to the rectification of the family then undoubtedly the sisters they play a very key vital and important role it can arguably be said that they play the most important role as relates to it because they are the teachers of the children and they are the educators of the next generation ala kulli hal it is a commitment that every muslim rather every human being that every human being and we say every human being because islam is a deen is a way of life for all humanity for all human beings from the men and from the jinn islam is for them now it is not for one group to the exclusion of another group but rather it's for all of mankind and it is incumbent and it is important that as as we are rearing our children that we interact with them and we have different ways of educating them from those ways are or is to educate them via q and a questions and answers <coughs> now that we ask them a question and then teach them the answer so that the next time we ask them the question then they know the proper answer because when it comes every muslim male and female they have to know three very important matters those matters are ma'rifatul abd rabb that an individual he has to know who his lord is he has to know who is his lord wa ma'rifatul abd dinahu and an individual they have to know what is their religion wa ma'rifatul abd nabiyyahu muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and everyone they have to know who is their prophet naam so we should teach our children amongst this manner asking them who is your lord to which of course they will respond by saying allah and then we should ask them who created you and they will respond by saying allah and then as we go into the park or yani to the beach or to what what have you that we point out to our children and we reinforce this lesson to them by asking them for example who created this shell and of course allah who created the the birds the seagulls yani and the like they will say allah who created the ocean they will say allah so on and so forth now i'm so as to so as to reinforce this within our children and this is something that is a very good exercise that we should employ when it comes to our small children now and of course this is more specific or this is yani uh, being said to the women more so we should say because typically they spend more time with the children so their reinforcing of these things it will be 
of greater value than the limited time that most fathers have. However, this is not to say that the fathers are off the hook and they have no responsibility as relates to this, but no, rather the father should strive to educate his family. He should strive his earnest and his best to educate his family and point them to those things that will benefit them, strive his earnest to educate his family and to show them and to point them away and deter them from those things that will hurt them, those things that will harm them. This is a very, very, very important, uh, very, very important responsibility that is on every Muslim man, every Muslim woman. We are still talking about what are the conditions for La ilaha illallah. Naam. We have completed the meaning. What is the meaning of La ilaha illallah? This tremendous statement by way in which an individual will enter into Islam. This kalima that is a kalima that is baqiya, yani, uh, it, it is a kalima that remains uh, as we have been informed after our father Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Our father Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, he called the people to la ilaha illallah. And Ibrahim is how we say uh, Abraham in Arabic. Now, the father of what they say, the father of the monotheistic religions. But likewise, those prophets and messengers that came before Ibrahim, they also called their people to La ilaha illallah, from the prophet Nuh or Noah, Naam, and the like. They called their people to La ilaha illallah. And all of the prophets after Ibrahim called their people to La ilaha illallah. So the prophet Musa or Moses, alayhi salatu was salam, he called his people to La ilaha illallah. The Prophet Isa, Jesus, he called his people to La ilaha illallah. And likewise, the final Prophet and Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he called his people to La ilaha illallah. So it's incumbent that we understand what is the meaning of this. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us inside of his noble book, وَمَا بَعَثْتُ وَلَقَدَ بَعَثْتُ فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةً رَسُولًا أَنِعْمَدُ اللَّهَ وَاشْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ And verily we have sent to every nation a messenger saying and proclaiming, Worship Allah alone and stay away from the false deities. Worship Allah alone and stay away from the false deities. And this is the call of every prophet and every messenger. All of the prophets and the messengers of Ben Israel, the children of Israel, all of the prophets and the messengers that have ever been sent to the earth, they have called their people to worship Allah and Allah alone, to worship the Creator and not to worship the creation because the only one who deserves to be worshipped is the creator and hence it goes back to the meaning of la ilaha illallah la ma'buda bihaqqin illallah that none has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah so by that this is the covenant that the believer takes where they yani, acknowledge and they testify to the fact that all forms and all acts of worship then they belong to the Creator. They belong to Allah and to Allah alone. And that there is no one or no thing that has any portion or deserves anything as relates to worship. Whether that thing is a prophet, or whether that thing is an angel, or whether that thing is a rock, a stone, a tree, celestial body, so on and so forth. All of the worship belongs to Allah and Allah alone. So our fasting is for Allah. Our prayer is for Allah. Our sacrifice is for Allah. Everything we do is for Allah and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Now, this is key. This is key. Because as the ulama, they mention that la ilaha illallah is miftah jannah That la ilaha illallah, then this is the key to jannah. Now, this is the key to heaven. If we want to go to heaven, then we have to... We have to testify and bear witness to the fact of La ilaha illallah because this is the very purpose that we have been put here on this planet. Naam. We've been put here on this planet and the reason for our creation, the reason for our existence is so that we establish the worship to Allah and Allah alone. That we establish true monotheism to the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that exists inside of the universe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in his noble book, and I did not create the jinn nor the mankind except for them to worship me. Now, this is the purpose of life. That we establish worship to Allah and Allah alone. This is the purpose of life. That we adorn ourselves with the true way of life that Allah has revealed to mankind inside of throughout all of the books. 
all of the books that were revealed to the prophets and the messengers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was calling human beings at those particular times and era, uh, uh, yani eras inside of yani, uh, this, this, this world to worship Allah and Allah alone. They were being called to Islam because every single prophet, every single messenger, then they were a Muslim. They were a Muslim, na'am, in their religion was Islam. Their way of life was Islam. Because Islam, it means that we submit ourselves to the will of Allah. That we submit ourselves to the will of the Creator. We submit ourselves to the Creator by way of Tawheed, by way of true monotheism. And we worship Him, we worship Him alone. That we yani, submit ourselves to the Creator and we are compliant in obeying Him. That we obey His commands and we follow out His commands and we stay away from the prohibitions. We, as Muslims, we free ourselves from polytheism and from the polytheists, all forms and all types and all shapes of polytheism. We free ourselves from it. This is what it means to be a Muslim. And every single prophet and messenger, you find this was their way, is that they called their people to worship the Creator alone. And they warned their people from the worship of idols. They warned their people from the worship of false deities, so on and so forth. And because the religion or the deen way of life, we should say, of Islam is complete, then we have guidance for every single thing inside of the deen of Al-Islam. So from how we live our lives on a day-to-day -day manner, from how yeah, any, uh, the world is run, and so on and so forth, we have guidance as relates to it. Now, we have guidance as relates to it. And we implement these things and we do these things because ultimately we want to go to heaven. Ultimately, it, we want that when we meet our Creator, that when we meet our Lord on the day of judgment, that He is pleased with us, that we meet Him while being from the people of true monotheism. We meet Him by being of the people who followed His prophets and messengers, that we meet Him by by being those who have adorned themselves with the true way of life and the true religion, and that is Al-Islam. <laughs> Back to the point. La ilaha illallah is the miftah, is the key for the Jannah. But every miftah, it has asnan. Every key, it has teeth. Naam, those ridges that are on the key, these are the teeth. And if we were to shave down one of the ridges, then we will find that the key will not operate. It won't work. Man, if we to shave down two, we find it won't work. The key only works when you have all of the ridges, all of the grooves, all of the teeth. Then the key will work. Man. So, when it comes to la ilaha illallah, we have to know first and foremost what is the meaning. We have to know what are the arkan, what are the pillars of la ilaha illallah. And we went over what are the pillars of la ilaha illallah. Because the pillars of la ilaha illallah, then they are two. They are two. Man. Who remembers which one they are? Now, affirmation and negation. Affirmation and negation. Ahsant. <clears throat> affirmation and negation. Now, that we affirm all worship to Allah and Allah alone, and we negate worship from everything that is not Allah. Now, so anything other than Allah, then we negate. There's no worship for it. Now, so would it be truthful to say that as Muslims, it is completely prohibited to worship Muhammad? That's true. Of course. Naam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he doesn't deserve anything from worship. Okay, is it true to say as Muslims, we do not worship Jibreel, the angel Gabriel? Is that true? Yes, we do not worship Gabriel. Why? Because as mighty as he is, he is not worthy of worship. Nothing from worship belongs unto him because he is a slave of Allah he worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. So this, these things are important. Naam. And when it comes to other than Allah from those things that are worshipped, then we understand as comes inside the kalima of la ilaha illallah that their worship is done so in falsehood. We negate this. It is not correct. It is not proper. And the dalil, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَقِّ وَأَنَّ مَا يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ الْبَاطِلِ And that is because Allah, He is the truth. And verily that which is called upon other than Him, then is done so in falsehood. So those things that are called upon other than Allah, then is done in falsehood. Whereas the only one who is worshipped in truth, then it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these are from the keys of la ilaha illallah. Likewise, there are conditions that are also from the keys of la ilaha illallah that if we do not fulfill these conditions, then our utterance of the statement of la ilaha illallah, then it will not benefit us. Naam. So these also, all of this are very key, important things that the mothers in particular have to, one, be upon themselves. They have to be firmly grounded. 
in these matters. And two, they have to convey this to their children, teach their children, they're starting from a very early age, a very early age. And do not underestimate the intelligence of children. Children, they, in many cases, can do a lot more than we perceive. Now, they're a lot smarter a lot of times than we may recognize. Children are very smart. They're, they're, yeah, they, uh, they, they watch very well and they pick up lessons even when we don't think we're teaching them lessons. Now, so it is incumbent that we don't underestimate their intellectual capacity and that we teach them from a very, very early age the true belief. Who created you? And have them say, Allah. Who created the tree? They will say, Allah. So on and so forth. Where Allah? They will point up. Ar-Rahman al-Arshistawa. The most beneficent is above his throne. From an early age, you can teach children these things. Na'am. Yeah. From the conditions that we also have to not just teach, but instill inside of our children and inside of ourselves if we truly want success. Na'am. Is that we have to teach them that la ilaha illallah, it has conditions. The first of those conditions is ilm, na'am, is knowledge. Because if they don't have knowledge of what la ilaha illallah means, then how will they benefit? Na'am, they, will, they won't be able to benefit and they won't be fulfilling the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah ta'ala, he says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And know, have knowledge that nothing has the right to be worshipped the truth except Allah. So Allah commands us to have knowledge about this. Allah commands us to know to seek, to study. Na'am. So if our children are unaware of how to say it, and if they are unaware of its meaning, then how can they ever properly believe in it? How can you believe in something that, that you're ignorant of? It's impossible. You will not be able to do it. Na'am. So the first condition from the conditions of La ilaha illallah is bi ma'naha. Then we have to know its meaning. Na'am. We have to know its meaning. Nafyan wa ithbatan. We have to know its meaning and that yani, it negates and that it affirms. That it negates and that it affirms. Naam. Al munafi li jahl. The type of knowledge that will negate ignorance. Naam. A type of knowledge that will negate ignorance. So we say that we have in, in it to, uh, so, uh, as, as, as such that we cannot be categorized as being ignorant of it. Naam. That makes sense? That we have to know what is the meaning of La ilaha illallah. And of course, like everything else in the religion, what's the proof? The proof was the aforementioned ayah from Surah Muhammad and it's verse number 19. So sisters, this is a verse that you have to get down. So that's Surah Muhammad and it's verse 19. And on the homework, ta'ala, all of these would definitely be on the homework. To provide what are the conditions with their proofs and evidences. Now, with the proofs and evidences. And in particularly, the proofs and evidences that were mentioned here in this class. Now, wait. So, Surah Muhammad, verse 19. Allah Ta'ala, He says, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And know, have knowledge. Have knowledge. Now, that none has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. And it comes a hadith, عَنْ عُثْمَانِ بِنْ عَفَانِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ وَأَرُضَّاهُ قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من مات وهو يعلم أنه لا إله إلا الله دخل الجنة. And his hadith hadith صحيح رواه مسلم. And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said as it comes in hadith hadith Uthman where he said that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said whoever dies من مات whoever dies وهو يعلم whoever dies and he knows whoever dies and he knows meaning he has علم he has knowledge. نعم now, it's important to understand this. To know something means that you implement it. Now, to know something means you implement it. You have knowledge. Because if you're aware of a certain thing and you go against it, then that's, that's tantamount and that equals ignorance. Now, so what it means that you know, it means this person, he knew that none has the right to be worshipped the truth except Allah. And they worshipped Allah alone and they did not worship anything else. However, the shahni here is the kalima, ya'lam. This is the yani wajr istidlal here is the phrase ya'lam that they have knowledge because the condition the first condition is that we have knowledge na'am so if you look to the verse it says fa'lam have knowledge have knowledge it commands us to have knowledge if you look to the hadith it says wa huwa ya'lam and he has knowledge that whoever dies and he has knowledge that none has the right to be worshiped the truth except Allah dakhala al-jannah then they will enter into the jannah na'am that makes sense so ilm 
is a must. Having knowledge of this, it is a must. It is incumbent that we have knowledge of this. And this is why these things are tremendously important that we teach our children these things. Now, and I want everyone to do their own evaluation. Do, you, do a self-evaluation. Look at your family. Now, before that, look at yourself. Look at yourself and to see, do you know the meaning of La ilaha illallah? Do you know the conditions of La ilaha illallah? Do you know the pillars of La ilaha illallah? Ask yourself these things first. Because in fact, the one who's deprived of something, they won't have the ability to give it. Now, I stress this, of course, with the sisters as well, because, or with the sisters, yeah, we should say, because there are many things that we often rush to teach young children that are beneficial to them, no doubt, but whose benefit is temporary, meaning it's only that which will benefit them here in this life overall, and those things that will truly benefit them in this life and in the next, sometimes we are neg neglectful of them. So when it, comes to, when it comes to teaching the children A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, we make sure they learn this, make sure they learn this early. A for apple, B for boy, yani C for cat, so on and so forth. We make sure they learn these things early and we put a lot of time and effort into teaching them the likes of these things. Now, I'm not discouraging that because that's very important and it's very beneficial in the life of a human being. However, to do that and not teach them the likes of these things, who is their Lord, to do that and not teach them the meaning of la ilaha illallah, to do that and not teach them yani, how to properly say la ilaha illallah and so on and so forth is a tragedy. Because these things are that which will help them here in this life and in the next life. It will help them here in the dunya and in the akhirah. Nah. You know? So it is important that we continue and we strive to teach our children these very important lessons. And that we make sure that they can say properly, La ilaha illallah. We make sure that they know its meaning and they understand what it points to. And they understand its conditions, so on and so forth. But... We can't do that if we don't get it ourselves. And this is, yani, hence, uh, from the reason why these things are being spoken about first and foremost as relates to these uh, classes. Because, yes, they are sister classes because we want our sisters to benefit. But we want our sisters to benefit in such a way that it's almost like teacher training so that they could, therefore, become better teachers to their children, better teachers to their nieces and nephews, better teachers to their sisters, ma'am, and so on and so forth. This is of tremendous uh, importance. The next condition is yaqeen. That a person has to have yani, uh, certainty. Al yaqeen al munafi is shak. They have to have certainty and they can't doubt it. Naam? Because if a person were to doubt la ilaha illallah, they were to doubt what is the meaning. If they were yani, mutaraddid, naam? they were apprehensive. I, I, think it, I, think, I think it's true, but I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think this is the meaning, but man, I'm not sure if that's true or not, and so on and so forth. Then it won't benefit them. If they come to it apprehensively, if they come to it and they have doubt, then it won't benefit them. But they have to have yaqeen, they have to have certainty. Naam? Because when a person, yani, a, a belief that is true is, a, is, is that which is certain. You have no doubt about it. Naam? That when it comes to who deserves to be worshipped, Allah. A person doesn't doubt and say, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe the moon, maybe. I don't know, maybe a tree, maybe, maybe a cow, maybe. No, no, no maybe. Those things do not deserve worship. Allah deserves worship alone. That's it. Alone. Naam? So we have to be certain about it. And if a person doubts, if a person doubts, La ilaha illallah, then it won't benefit him. It won't help. It won't benefit him at all. But they have to have certain knowledge of it. And what is the proof of this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in his noble book, and this is in Surah Al-Hujarat, Surah Al-Hujarat, in his verse 15. Naam. So again, Surah Al-Hujarat in his verse 15. Sisters, there are Musahif on your side. I believe some translations of the Noble Quran there as well. Yani, if you have time or the app on your phone, whatever the case is, turn to the verse so you can look at it as we go through it. Allah Ta'ala, he says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَرْتَابُوا That verily, the believers, they are those... Let's go back. Verily. Because this is the same word. In Nama. 
Naam, like we took in hadith 40, like we took in the like we took in a 40 hadith class, right? And then we said that innama is a word that is restrictive, right? It is a word that is restrictive, meaning that you understand from it only, right? Like in the ayah, innama mu'minun and ikhwa, that verily the believers, they are only brothers. Naam, they, they, they're nothing else, they're brothers. Naam. Which is yeah, a tremendous thing. But we understand that only part from innama. Just like in a hadith, innama al-a'malu bin niyat. The verily actions are only but by their intentions. They're only by their intentions. That's it. Now, whether they're correct or they're not correct, and so on and so forth, then that is only and solely looking at their intention as relates yani, to that, 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 that portion or that yani, condition for the acceptance of, of, of deeds. Now, and that every action has an intention, everyone will be rewarded based upon what they intended. Now, so we find this same word coming here again. That verily the believers, the believers are who? They are only, the only ones who are believers, the only ones who are believers. So when you say the only ones, then it means these are the only ones who are believers and those who are not yani, uh, adorned with the following characteristic, then that means what? They're not believers. That makes sense? That means they're not believers. So Allah Ta'ala, he says that verily the believers, they are only those who say, I, or, yeah, the, the believers are only those who believe, they're only those who believe in Allah and in his messenger, and then they have no doubt. Lam yartabu. Then they have no doubt. Naam? Lam yartabu. طيب. So the part and the point of evidence here in this ayah is what statement? Remember, to establish certainty. So what phrase in the verse identifies that certainty must be established? Who knows? Hmm? And then they have no doubt. If they have no doubt, what does that mean? Because they are Certain. Now, having no doubt is because they're certain. So Allah Ta'ala said that verily the believers are only those who believe in Allah and His Messenger, and then they have no doubt. They have no doubt because they are certain. So we understand the opposite. They have no doubt because they're certain. Now, so that's, that's the point of, of, of reference. So a person was to say, they bring you the ayah, and they say, okay, this ayah here, how is this a proof that leads to certainty? It leads, they have cert- or how is the proof that, to point out certainty? It points out certainty because they have no doubt. And the opposite of doubt is what? It's certainty, that they're certain about it. Now, and this is of tremendous importance. The takeaway is that, and also to show us how, for those who are interested in concern with benefiting, is that the believers are only these ones. Now, and if they don't fulfill this condition, they're not, they're not believers. Persons don't, he doubts it. Is there heaven? Is there really a hell? Uh, I don't know. He doubts, he doesn't know, he's not a believer. Because when you believe in something, you believe in it, right? You know it's, you know it's correct. There's no doubt about that. You know it's correct. Now, is, is, and does Allah exist? There's no doubt about that. Yes, of course. Now, does Jinnah exist? Yes, of course. Does the hellfire exist? Yes, of course. Yani, that's why we do what we do. That's why we, that's why we pray. That's why we yani, do things that Allah loves and is pleased with. Why? Because we want to go to Jannah. We don't want to go to hell. We want to go to heaven. We don't want to go to hell. Now, this is why we live the lives that we live, while we're nice and kind to animals, while we're kind to other human beings, while we establish everyone's rights, while we're kind to our parents, so on and so forth. Now we love our parents, no doubt about that. Now we love yeah, any human beings and you know, people love animals and so on and so forth, but that is not the motivating factor. The motivating factor is because Allah commanded us to give everyone who has a right, their rights. Allah commanded us to be good and dutiful to our parents. Allah commanded us to be dutiful to other human beings and, and, uh, and treat them appropriately. Allah commanded us to be dutiful to the animals, to be kind to the animals. Allah commanded us to be dutiful yeah, to the roadways and so on and so forth and to not throw pollutants and things that may harm people inside of the, 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 the walkways. Now, so all of these things from our yeah, the, uh, conservationist spirit of uh, not polluting and, 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 and taking care of the earth, right, to being good to our parents, to establishing rights, to giving charity, so on and so forth. All of these things are taught to us in the deen of al-Islam because these are things that Allah has commanded us to do. These are things that Allah loves and that Allah is pleased with. So when an individual, Ghani, uh, is concerned 
about pleasing their Lord and they have yani, God consciousness as they say yani, in Arabic, meaning that they, 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 they live their lives in such a way that they, that, that they acknowledge and they know Allah is watching them. Now, they live their lives in such a way that they know that the Creator is watching them. And this is a very important thing that we have to teach our children so that they know Allah is watching you. Allah knows what you're thinking. Allah knows what you're, yani, the games you may be trying to play or the things you want to hide. Allah hears you. Allah sees you. So on and so forth. Because that, by way in which if a person understands that reality, then that, by way of which they'll be able to govern their actions. So that they would, yani, they're not going to say this thing. Even though they may want to say it, they're going to withhold from saying this bad, word, this bad thing, this bad word, because they know Allah is not pleased with, these, with, with this type of foul speech and foul language. They, they may want to act out or do certain things, but they know we're not going to do that because Allah is not pleased that you will act in such a, a, a bad manner, that you will steal or you will lie, you will cheat, so on and so forth. Allah is not pleased with these things. Now, so therefore, they're not going to do them. And the motivation that they do it is not because they're scared of Abby. It's not because they're scared of the father. It's not because, oh, Baba, come home, he's going to get you. Now, before they're scared of their father, they're scared of Allah. Before they're scared of their father, they're scared of Allah. I don't, I don't want Allah to be angry with me. I don't want to meet Allah and then I go to hell. I want Allah to be pleased with me. So when you find that we yani, teach our children this true, yani, this true uh, 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 faith, now, then the fruits of it will first be the, the enjoyment of it will be reaped rip by the parents because they will have good children, dutiful children, children that don't lie to them, children that don't try to swindle them, children that are not disobedient to them, children that are not undutiful to them. Ma'am, so they're going to be the first ones to benefit. Ma'am, and then all of the society because they're going to take that outside the homes. So they're not going to infringe upon the rights of the neighbors. They're not going to fringe upon the property of the neighbors. They're not going to speak bad to the neighbors. Now, it will, tra it, yani, it will translate into a very good, outstanding, wholesome human being, a good member of society. Always trying to bring good to the people and trying to push away from them harm. Now, this type of things, yani, they don't come out of nowhere. Individuals have to be taught the likes of how to excel and to carry these things out in light of the book in the sunnah. Now, these are not things that a person would just figure out on their own, so on and so forth. No, not in its totality. But in order to an uh, individual to being pointed to the best way of life that they can possibly live, to live their best life, is that they have to do it in light of the book and in the sunnah. And where that starts, or where it should start, is inside the home. That's where it should start. Those who want guidance, Allah will guide them. Now, those who want guidance, Allah will guide them. Allah's promise, He will guide them. So, there are individuals who their parents didn't teach them. They grow up the wrong way, and Allah guides them, and then they become Muslim and they see what is true because they wanted the truth. They were searching for it. Now, however, this should not be the route that we want to subject our children to. This is not the route that we want to subject our children to. No, figure it out when you get older. Right? And the reason why is obvious. We don't do that when it comes to the things of the dunya, do we? No. We don't tell our children, oh, you figure it out later. I'm not going to teach you how to, yani, hygiene. You'll figure it out. When you get older and you start not smelling right and your teeth fall out because they're rotten, then I think you'll figure it out. Maybe you should brush your teeth and you should wash and bathe. We don't do that. But we teach them from when they're little. Wash your face, brush your teeth, take a shower, you know what, take a bath, got to take a bath. We teach them when they're little, put on lotion, yeah, oil your skin, comb your hair. We teach them from when they're little about these things. We don't leave them just to figure it out. So we are concerned about these things from hygiene, which is also from, from Islam. That's, that's, that's from the deen, ma'am. That's from the deen. This is more so to the brothers now. To the brothers, yes, it's from the deen. Ma'am, a proof of this, right? Is that uh, Jibreel, alayhi salatu salam, when he came to the Prophet, alayhi salam, and he asked questions, he came and his, his throat was exceedingly white hair, exceedingly black, meaning that what? He was clean. He came with beautiful looking clothes. He came in the most finest way, and so on and so forth. And at the end of that hadith, the Prophet, alayhi salam, he said, he came to you to teach you your religion. So the manner in which he came is very important. So as Muslims, we have to be concerned with hygiene. The Prophet Sallallahu he said that if he thought it would be, and what means, if he thought it would be a, 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 a hardship on his ummah, on his nation, he would make them brush their teeth, right? 
for 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 for, for every yani, uh, salah for every wudu make them brush their teeth. You see, so this shows us that what that being cleanliness being clean is from the deen. Naam tahara suliman. Naam yani cleanliness is is a great portion of 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 of, of faith. So I'm saying to say is that this is that for the brothers in particular. From the way and manner that we treat our women good is that we stay looking sharp. We stay with our hair combed, with our beards combed. You moisturize your skin, you moisturize your hair, you put on oils, and so on and so forth. The Prophet وسلم, his wife said that when he came home, the first thing he would do was to be to brush his teeth. When he woke up, the first thing he would be to do was to brush his teeth. Why? Because you don't want to engage with your significant other and your breath is not right. Naam. So it is important that what that that the men also that we take yeah you know, just like we want the women to get nice and you know dress nice for us and you know uh, and that type of stuff our, our wives and that then as men we got to do that too we have to look good for our women Naam. so that means you got to do some push ups sit ups whatever the case is stay in shape now I'm stay in shape and look good for look good for your wife now I'm smell good for your wife don't let her catch you when you're not smelling well don't let her catch you when your breath is not right. Carry your siwak, brush your teeth, because the brushing of your teeth, yeah, it, 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 it's pleasing to Allah, and it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it freshens your breath. These are all beautiful good things that we are encouraged to do in the deen of al-Islam. Naam. Ala kulli hal. All of these things are of tremendous importance. Naam. Tayyip. Like, what is another proof and evidence that, what's another proof and evidence that we have to have certainty? Naam. There comes a hadith, the Ruahu Muslim, and it's from the hadith of Abi Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the Prophet sallallahu he told to him, مَن لَقِيْتَ مِنْ وَرَائِ هَذِ الْحَائِطَ يَشْهَدُ إِنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَشْهَدُ إِنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ مُسْتَيْقِنًا بِهَا قَلْبُهُ فَبَشِّرُهُ بِالْجَنَّةِ The Prophet sallallahu he said, and I'm just going to give you the translation, I want you to tell me, what is the point of evidence? Yani, uh, which shows that having certainty is from the conditions of La ilaha illallah. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Whoever you meet from behind this wall, and they testify, because the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Huraira here in his, in, his, in his hadith, they were in like a garden or some place where it had walls around it, right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he told him, Whoever you meet outside this place, outside these walls, and they testify that none has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. That nothing has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. And their heart is certain. Then give them glad tidings of Jannah. Give them glad tidings that they're going to go to heaven. Now, so now what's the point of reference? What's the point of evidence here in this hadith? Is which part? Who knows? What is the question again? What is the point of evidence here in this hadith? Which states, which, which shows us that we have to have certain, we have to have certainty as relates to La ilaha illallah. Okay, repeat. Okay. Okay. Huh? Now, that, that their heart has what? Okay. Their heart is certain, right? That whoever you meet behind this wall and they say, La ilaha illallah. They, they, they testify, they testify that none has the right to be versed in the truth except Allah. So that right there shows us what we're talking about. That we're talking about the shahada. That whoever says, La ilaha illallah. Right? Wait. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said that their heart is certain as relates to it. They say it and the heart is certain. Now, because to testify to it and your heart's not certain, it doesn't, it doesn't help. It's not going to benefit you. But you have to what, testify for it, testify to it, and your heart has to have certainty as relates to it. So if this was yeah, and he, uh, established, you brought these both of these things together in an individual that they testified that none has the right to be worshipped the truth except Allah, and then they were certain about it, their heart was certain about it, then give them glad tidings. So that's how a person they would be yeah, and he, uh, they they would uh, benefit from it. Now Fashtarata Fidukul Iqail Fashtar Fidukul Iqail Fidjanna that the person that says it, in order for them to enter into the Jannah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a stipulation that their heart has to be certain. Mustaqeen and bihi, 
أو بها قلبه that his heart has to have certainty as relates to لا إله إلا الله so it's a type of certainty that negates doubt so they're certain to a type of certainty that negates doubt now and this is of tremendous importance and things that we have to instill inside of our children from an early age especially when you let them go out into the world and go amongst yani, the wolves as they lack of a better term as they say because sometimes when they're not properly educated right, when they, when they don't have the proper rearing and the proper islamic education they start to have doubts they start to have doubts now they start to become confused they have doubts about their religion anybody who you come and they say they have doubts about islam yeah uh, 9 9.5 times out of 10 9.5 times out of 10 let's say no 10 times out of 10 they have doubts and they're ignorant they're ignorant with the type of ignorance that is easily removed with knowledge but because they don't have that knowledge they have these doubts now so it is incumbent if we want to save our children our families ourselves from falling into the likes of these doubts then we have to have knowledge because when you have knowledge and the doubt comes you can easily remove the doubt with the aim with the knowledge now but when you don't have knowledge and a doubt comes the doubt might take you out because now you don't know you don't know what to say you don't you don't understand now so it is incumbent that we prepare our children so that they are certain and they yani um, they have no doubt as relates to it now <laughs> inshallah uh, the next the next um, condition is the condition of acceptance that we have to accept it now because if a person knows the meaning they don't have doubt as relates to what the meaning is and what it points to but then they don't accept it now would it benefit them and of course the answer is no it won't benefit them now we'll get more into that in the next class inshallah ta'ala but for now yeah, I mean, to, uh, a, a proof to show us how it didn't benefit because they wouldn't accept it was like uh, Heracl. Now, the, the emperor of Rome, the one that was yeah, I mean, uh, ruling, and when the caravan came through from the Quraysh and he questioned them about the Prophet, Hadith Heracl, he knew. He knew. He had knowledge. And he knew certainty. He, was, he, he wasn't confused about it. He knew that the Prophet وسلم, was the Prophet. He was the Messenger of Allah. Naam. But when he saw from his, from his people that they will not accept that and that he could not stay in his position of power and authority and, rich, and, and, and riches, yani if, if, if he were to accept Islam, when he saw that they wouldn't go for it, then what did he do? He rejected. He, didn't, he never accepted Islam. Naam. So, did, so did it benefit him? No. He didn't, he didn't accept it. Right, uh, a very uh, small example as well will be like if you're hungry, right? You're hungry, and you, you're gonna you know, on a, on a, on the brink of dying from starvation, and then you get presented with food, and you get presented with with water, and you say, "I know that's food. I know it's gonna help me. I know that's water. I know I need to drink it, so on and so forth." And I'm certain about it. I have no doubt. I need to eat that food and drink that water. But then you, but then you push the plate away, you push the, you push the tray away, and you don't drink it. Will you benefit from that meal? No, not unless you accept it, not unless you eat it. So just your knowledge of it and being certain about it is not going to help you if you don't accept it. And this is how you see that all of these are 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 are, are key components and intri and intricate. Uh, yani, what do you call it? Uh, teeth on on this key. That if one is not there, it's not going to benefit. If you don't accept it, you won't benefit. If you don't have knowledge about it, you won't benefit because you, you can't accept or, 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 you know, or have certainty when that which you don't know about. If, 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 if you doubt it, you won't benefit. Now, so if you have knowledge and you accepted it, but you doubt it, you won't benefit. If you have knowledge and you're certain, but you don't accept it, you won't benefit. If you, if, you know, to the end of it. Now, so we need them all. And this is why it's so, so important for us to know. Now, and it's so important for us 
yani, uh, to teach and to continuously go over and to make sure our children are well versed as relates to them. So for this week, we have taken the first condition. We have taken an ayah as a proof and a hadith as a proof. We have taken the second condition. Likewise, we have an ayah as a proof, Surah Al-Hujarat, verse 15, and we have taken a hadith as a proof. And this will be on the homework, and as relates to the proofs and the evidences, when it comes to the, to the hadith, then you have to know who was the narrator, where it's collected, and what is the hadith. Now, what is the, who's the narrator, where it's collected, and what is the hadith. Now, and as relates to the ayah, then you have to know where it is contained, where, yani, uh, chapter and verse. You have to know where it is, chapter and verse. Now, and all of this, bithnilahi ta'ala, will be on the homework. And we'll save going into the third in more depth and detail to the next class. And that's what we'll pick up on, bithnilahi ta'ala. فَنَكْتَفِي بِهَذَا الْقَدَرِ وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وجزاكم الله خيرًا